in equality and diversity issues. I know a little bit about the law, nowhere near as much as Paul, uh, but we'll be heckling him as we go through. That's great. Thank you very much indeed. It's supposed to say over and out at the end. Or... <laughs> yes, that's fine. Yeah. That's great. Thank you. Yaya, can I ask you to go next and then we'll see if Andrea's got her uh, sound problem uh, sorted by then. Yes, hello everyone, and um, great to put the faces to the names, etc., of uh, people that I've been corresponding with to organize the webinars. Um, I have, well, at the moment, I'm working with Katina on organizing these, um, these webinars that are going to run up to Easter and then beyond. And I'm very excited to say that we've got 12 scheduled, including today, and quite a few others in the pipeline. And also, I hope to deliver one uh, myself in April that's going to be around refugees and mental health. That's great. Thank you very much indeed, Yo. And it looks like Andrea's good to go. So I'm going to unmute her <laughs> and see if, you, if you've got everything connected, Andrea. Over to I you. Am, I am indeed. Thanks, Katina. Um, I'm Andrea Johnson and I run Equality North East. Uh, I've press ganged my colleagues into supporting us on uh, developing this uh, sort of series of webinars. So thank you very much for, um, for Katina for inviting us along. Um, it's the first time we've tried this technology, so please bear with us. That's great, thanks Andrea. Okay, so um, I am about to just ask one question if anybody's got any other technical questions around the um, controls or anything like that. Okay, so that was really just to give you a chance to either decide where you're going to unmute yourself to chip in or where you're going to type something in the chat. Um, and don't forget, you can also do the raise hand by clicking where it says participants. Um, Paul, I think that you have control uh, of the screen and obviously you can do the full slide, you know, slideshow thing if you want to. So I'm going to shut up at this point and I'm going to hand um, hosting over to you um, and let you get started. Um, and when you need to bring somebody else in, just say, and, and we'll unmute them, all right? But you can do that yourself. You can do it if you want, all right? So there you go. It's over to you, Paul. And you Thanks, Katina. I think Andrea was going to do a little bit of an introductory few yeah. minutes, actually. So if, um, Andrea, can you do that now? I can indeed. Um, thanks, thanks, Paul. Thanks, Katina. Uh, welcome, everyone. The main part of this session, as you probably have heard, will be delivered by my colleague, Paul. Um, but before we hear from Paul, I'd like to tell you a little bit about Equality North East. Equality North East started life back in 1997 as a government funded project called Fair Play for Women, which is very appropriate considering it's International Women's Day tomorrow. It was one of nine regional initiatives set up specifically to address the issues faced by women in the workplace. In the 1990s, it, um, in the late 90s, it became apparent that there were other inequalities across society and through our work with the RDA, One North East, we were encouraged to establish a, a sustainable business model. So in 1993, uh, sorry, in 2003, Equality North East became a company limited by guarantee and the focus changed to incorporate the wider pan equalities agenda. And our reason for existence is to work towards the removal of barriers to employment for minority and disadvantaged groups. In 2012, we became a wholly owned subsidiary of Gateshead College and we are one of the founding members of the National Network of Equalities Networks. And you'll hear more from the other members of the network if you're joining us for the other webinars in the series throughout March. We work with organisations across all sectors to build capacity and realise tangible business benefits through the Equality Standard and Equality Standard Gold Award. The, the standards are nationally recognised and designed to help employers to truly embed equality and diversity across their business. And we host the North East Equality Awards. The awards are a platform for organisations, groups and individuals to showcase what they do on a daily basis. And each year we receive hundreds of nominations demonstrating how some people go over and above what they're required to do simply because it's the right thing to do. 
And this year we've introduced two out of region categories. So for those of you from outside the Northeast, please watch out for the launch of the awards. The nomination process opens on the 7th of April, uh, World Health Day. Here's just a selection of the winners um, from past years. Um, we published case studies uh, on our website to share best practices and facilitate knowledge transfer. And we launched our Connect for Change network in 2006 to bring together like-minded organisations. Now, like many of the networks nationally, we've had our ups and downs and we've seen many organisations across the equality sector lost over the last five years. And our journey really has been like a roller coaster, but creating transformational change does take a certain amount of courage to raise your head above the parapet. Uh, we learn to duck very fast uh, and develop a thick skin. Um, our journey and the lessons that we've learned from it has allowed us to develop a resilience to ride out the highs and the lows of working together for the common good. And our Connecting for Change network brings together over 350 member organisations 20 equality champions, 1,500 plus individual members. We keep our members up to date with news and changes in the law uh, through our weekly bulletin and quarterly newsletters. So really what we are is an example of a virtual network that comes together periodically for events on topical issues. And this year we're hoping to host our annual conference in May uh, and look at what the Northern Powerhouse means and the potential exit for Europe means for equality and business in general. And I've all, of course, I've already mentioned the, the North East Equality Award, which this year will be held on the 20th of October. And our members have, have access to our extensive knowledge bank through our website. It's widely recognised as a leading resource nationally, gets over 4 million hits per year. And lastly, I'd like to share a quote from the late Henry Ford, which I think sums up the ethos of the National Network of Equality Networks which is coming together as a beginning, keeping together as progress and working together as success. So I'd like, now I'd like to hand back over to Paul, who, as he mentioned earlier, is part of the Equality Northeast team. Paul has been, Paul has been a great supporter and worked alongside Equality Northeast for many years. And in his spare time, he's a solicitor and partner at Collingwood Legal, specialising in employment and quality law. So over to you, Paul. Thanks, Andrea. Um... Can everybody see the slides moving at the same time so that you can see that, can you? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I just wondered whether that was actually, because I can see it, but I wasn't sure with the kind of new yeah. um, technology that that was, you know, what everybody else could see. Um, I think that this session was billed as being uh, running through to half one, but when we agreed to do this, I think we we'd uh, agreed 45 minutes. So, I mean, I was thinking it would go through to, uh, sorry, to 1.45 or something, was it? So I think um, if it goes through to round about half one, that should probably be about right. Um, and I would encourage anybody who is, is, is out there to ask questions or just to chip in um, at any point. So please feel free. Um, it's just a small group, obviously. This is a bit of a first session, taster session. So, um, I think if everybody's fairly relaxed about that, that's absolutely fine by me. Okay. Somebody um, slides again. Sorry, what's that? If somebody needs to click on. Um, from I tried actually, Stephen, and it, it doesn't work. Does oh, there you go. Is that better? That's better, yeah. Okay, right. Well, good. Okay, well, so far, so good. Um, yeah, I had them on a full screen, and then for some reason it went to a smaller screen, but yeah, good. Yeah, yeah. I think it, it needs to be clicked on from current slide. You think? Is that what we should... I don't know, not like that one. Along the top it says from current slide. Yeah, there you go. Is that better? Right, thank you. Thank you. No charge for my technical abilities here. <laughs> thank you very much for the um, technical support. Um, this particular session has been built as kind of you know five years in, um, but really because it's the first one that we've done, I thought it'd be worthwhile just going through the, the principles of what the Equality Act is, um, with some examples of, of how it works in practice. Um, and as I said before, if anybody's got any queries or comments to make, then please just just chip in. Um, so the Equality Act has been around since um, I think October of 2010. So we're kind of five and a bit years in um, and it covers nine particular protected characteristics uh, and they're on the on the slide there age race sex disability 
uh, gender reassignment, sexual orientation, which obviously includes um, LGBT um, people, but also heterosexuals as well. Um, religion and philosophical belief, which is not necessarily political belief, but we are seeing some inroads um, through case law into possibly making political belief um, you know, covered by this, uh, this aspect of the Equality Act. Um, pregnancy and maternity, and obviously marriage and civil partnership. Um, so that's, that's the landscape. Um, it's also worth pointing out, I think, that um, you know, the, the Equality Act applies not only in the workplace, so obviously the, it's the kind of um, discrimination law that we all are familiar with, not being sexist, not being racist, not being ageist within the workplace, but the Equality Act has, has had a huge change, I think, personally, in relation to those principles being taken outside into the wider world, and that's in relation to the delivery of services. So those principles that we're all familiar with in the workplace are now out there in the, in the you know, big bad world. And I know that Steve um, had a, a couple of things that he, he was asking, you know, whether I would cover um, a particular points which are service delivery cases really and i don't know steve whether you want to um chip in on that now yeah uh, yeah thanks thanks well there was a, actually a couple of things a question i always get asked or tend to get asked is yeah will there be any other protected characteristics um and the only other two that people come up with are size of people mm -hmm. um, and hair coloring which I, I guess hair colouring nowadays, far from everybody but me, can be changed to suit whatever mood you're in. But um, size is something that kind of does get mentioned quite a bit. I know uh, it has been covered under disability to some extent. Uh, yeah. any, any thoughts on, would that, uh, anybody got any thoughts on whether size of people should be brought yeah. in? I well, guess that involves the, Yeah, you've given, you've given the kind of a bit of a... a the answer already because there was a, the Kaltoft case, which right. is a European case where a childminder lost the job because they, it was a chap who was large, he's, he's very, very overweight, obese, um, morbidly obese, so not, not just somebody who's you know slightly overweight, but somebody who's is really quite heavy. Um, and he brought a claim based on um, his being discriminated against on the grounds of his weight and his size because he lost his job. Um, as a result of that. And what the court said is that of itself, being overweight will not be uh, a protected characteristic. But the way that, and we're probably getting a little bit ahead of ourselves in terms of the, the slides, but I might as well deal with this now, is that um, if the weight of a person has an adverse impact on their ability to carry out normal day-to-day -day activities, a substantial adverse long-term effect on their ability to carry out normal day-to-day -day, day -day activities, then that could be constituted as a disability. But it's not the fact of being overweight itself, it's the consequences of being overweight, how that may impact upon your ability to, you know, things like mobility, manual dexterity, all that kind of thing, that right. could satisfy the test of disability under the Equality Act. Okay. Uh, so a woman who's seven foot tall, wanting to be an air stewardess wouldn't be able to kind of use that as a, 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 an argument for being discriminated against? Well, not necessarily because there might be a defence to that. So, yeah, discrimination could happen. You're not getting a job because you're too tall, but there might be a defence to that. So you can have the discrimination, but it's, it's you know, usually um, health and safety trumps everything. And I think that there may be issues around, you know, there are always going to be conflicts of legal principles in certain situations like that. And, and I know it's a bit of a glib thing to say, but usually health and safety trumps everything. And if you think that you're putting that person in an environment, a working environment, where their own health and safety or well-being may be damaged through physical injury because the, the, the aeroplane is too small, then that, that would be a legitimate reason not to give that person a job. Um, yeah. I know it's it's always going to be fact specific. Always you have to look at the facts of each case. But I think uh, you know that is how I would expect the law to to be looked at and analysed in that sense. Right. In in terms of hair, what do you mean by that? Are you talking about people who are ginger? 
well, that, that that was my main one. Of course, being being, I think it should cover people who are bald. But um, yeah, I think I'm the only one here who who that would apply to. But um, the, the abuse I get as a football referee for being bald is kind of nobody's business. And I, I think right. I should be able to bring discrimination claims against right. all of this. Well, you could possibly if if the uh, you know the insult in relation to having no hair is also related to your age. Oh, right, oh, of course, yeah, I never thought about that, yeah. So, so there may be ways in which you could bring that in, but hair of itself, and I, well, the reason why I asked the question about being ginger is that there seems to be a tolerance of, um, you know, insults related to people who are ginger when it's a, ra it's a race thing, I think, personally, it's your right. ethnicity. You know, your hair colour is determined by your ethnicity. So, oh, in theory, you should be able to bring a claim if somebody is making creating a hostile, intimidating environment for you, just as you would if somebody was uh, doing the same for somebody who's got cornrows in their hair, because there, are, there is actually a case on that for a, a, a young person, a young black person, who was subjected to discriminatory treatment because of their hairstyle. So I don't think it's too far removed to say hairstyle associated with a certain ethnic group. Why can't that apply to hair colour? associated with a particular ethnic group. Right. So I think actually your, your, your um, question is, is a very valid one and I think the law could, in the right circumstances, actually be used um, to you know, um, bring a claim, right. depending again on the facts of the claim. Does that mean you want all ginger people to contact you, Paul, to you become the ginger champion or something? I'm not, I'm not saying that, Steve. <laughs> I, I, if anybody, I'm sorry, it, it, <laughs> You know, in, in terms of a slightly humorous take on that, it can be very serious for the people involved. Um, I mean, I'm aware of a, a, a case that I know where there was, uh, you know, a couple of kids who were, you know, had ginger hair who were subjected to pretty awful harassment and abuse because they had ginger hair. They're of Irish extraction. So to me, it's a racist issue, right. you know, because yeah. Their, their yeah. hair colour was related to their ethnicity. And I think that that is something that could be um, addressed under the, under the law. My, my question with services, I'd be interested in everybody else's view, but I listened to a Radio Newcastle had a programme on following the Baker's case, in which yep. the baking a bakery refused to uh, make a cake for um, so, uh, two people who were gay. Yeah. The the, the 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 discussion on the radio was quite depressing because a lot of people ringing up were clearly bigots and stuff. But a lot of people were talking about uh, it's up to a shop to decide who they allow in as a customer, um, and nobody actually contradicted that. Unfortunately, the, the program was kind of pre-booked, so you couldn't get on. But um, clearly, it's not up to a shop as to who they serve or allow in or don't allow in. Um, but the public seemed to believe that it was, which was say, quite depressing. I wondered if that was the same in other parts of the country. Um, it's not a question to you specifically, Paul, but... Yeah, yeah okay. Has anybody got any comments on that? I don't know where John and Erica are based. But... Um, John and Erica are based in London. Um, I think they have just, um, whoops, they've just dipped out. Um, they, may be <laughs> they may be coming back in though, I think they said. Um, so uh, just to say, uh, that I don't know if you can see it, but there's a little raised hand um, as a kind of symbol um, up against me. So I'm just going to kind of lower that one. A um, couple of things really. Um, one was to say, um, one of the things I thought was quite interesting about the Baker's case that you were talking about is the amount of um, debate it has created around freedom of speech and so forth as well and, and around that particular protected ground in a way that wouldn't have happened if we hadn't if we hadn't had the same-sex marriage change in the legislation. So I thought that was really quite interesting, but it has um, created some really interesting debate. And one of the things I thought was really interesting was um, the way that Peter Tatchell has changed his views, you know, so he was kind of um, really clear at the beginning and then the more he's thought about it, he's changed his views about um, that particular case. So we have two more um, sessions this week that relate to uh, gender identity and sexual orientation. So I'm sure that one's gonna gonna kind of crop up there for right. further no, discussion. Um, just thinking about 
when you were talking about um, size and um, hair colour, and uh, it's a shame that um, John and Erica have, have dipped out, because one of the things I was thinking about was that um, we all work quite a lot around mental health, and one of the issues there is quite often people with mental health problems um, have considerable weight gain related to their, their mental health disability. Um, and often it's, it's those kinds of things that cause them the most anxiety or the most kind of, you know, adds to the stigma. And it was just to flag up, there's a great little video made by some children in Wales that's on the EHRC website that is about bullying. So it, it was, it's an animation made by children um, around bullying, but the bullying subject matter is around a child being fat, overweight, and it really is poignant. I've shown it to adults um, in training sessions, and to be honest, they end up in tears because suddenly they realise the kind of impact of that, not only on for themselves and things, you know, in different ways that have happened to them in their lives around any of the protected grounds, but because they realise what it does to kids. Um, so that one's, you know, I just pop that one in and I'll, I'll post the URL for that in the chat so that people who watch the recording can access that. Okay. Well, I think you're on target to finish about five o'clock now. <laughs> that's, that's fine. It's, it's all in general with any more questions. I love my job and uh, <laughs> it's, it's stuff like this that gets the, gets the brain going, doesn't it? Um, just coming back to your point though, Steve, if you want me to chip in a bit about that, the, the case, the Northern Irish Bakers case, and that was, that was about a, a married gay couple who wanted to have the Burton Early characters, I think they're from the Muppets or from the you know, Sesame Street or, or whatever, on their wedding cake, and that was refused. And the basis of the refusal was that the people who ran the bakery um, were of a strong religious belief and they did not believe in gay marriage. And that was similar to that um, case of the two chaps, um, Mr. Hall and Mr. Preddy, who went to the B&B, &B, who were denied a double bed, because not because they were married, but because of civil partnership status. So that was an earlier case. And again, it was because the people who owned that business, who owned the B&B, &B, were of a strong religious persuasion and didn't believe in civil partnerships. And um, so those two cases are kind of related. The, the bit of a pithy way I would try to describe the, the, the relevant factual scenario there is discrimination law is a shield. It's not a sword. It's not something that you can use to justify prejudice. And, and I know that there will be people out there who have very strong um, beliefs about their own protected characteristics. And that's absolutely fine. And you can use your protected characteristic to stop you know, people being intimidatory against you because you're protected under the law, but it does not justify you using that protected characteristic to express prejudice or to treat somebody less favorably. And that's the legal principle because discrimination law is based on treating somebody less favorably because. And the person in the bakery was treating that gay couple less favorably because they were gay. They wouldn't bake them a cake or they wouldn't decorate the cake. Mr. Hall and Mr. Preddy were treated less favorably because they were in a civil partnership compared to somebody who was in a, a, a kind of straight marriage. Um, and that's, that's very important in terms of trying to get your head around all of these legal principles. Less favorable treatment is unlawful if it's based upon a protected characteristic. And these, these cases going through an appeal, um, personally, I think they're bound to fail if the law is applied in the way that it should be applied because you can't get around it. You can't justify treating somebody less favorably because you have a particular protected characteristic. That's not how the law works. So I, I hope that that's fairly clear in terms of you know, why these cases have been decided in the way that they were. You know, everybody is intended to be treated on a level playing field based on their protected characteristics. Um, but I appreciate that that causes some real really difficult um, you know, uh, decisions for, for people who have very strong beliefs themselves. Um, so I hope, I hope that kind of makes sense. Yeah, thank you, Bob. Um, are we okay to move on to, uh, just to try to get through the, the kind of structured presentation that we've got? Again, though, I'm very happy to, to take points as, as we're going through. Um, burden of proof is on the employer. I mean, that's on the person who is, you know, maybe, um, 
accused of committing an act of discrimination. It's not absolutely 100% strictly true in that way, but I think we have a principle under the law in the UK where normally you would expect to be innocent until proven guilty. Whereas with equality law, all you really need to do is to have a, a very basic set of facts that might infer that discrimination has occurred. And then the burden of proof really does pass over at a very early stage onto the person who is accused to justify their behavior. Okay, so that's why I've kind of expressed it in that way. Also, very, very important to remember that um, unlike, say, unfair dismissal, so somebody is unfairly dismissed, the claim would be brought against the employing business or company. So no matter if the manager has got the decision to dismiss somebody wrong, for example, in a redundancy or a misconduct situation, the claim is not brought against the manager themselves. It's brought against the company, okay? That's not the same for uh, discrimination law. So you can have joint and several liability for a manager personally. So if a manager is dismissing somebody, for example, I'm not giving you a job because you're pregnant, and you know we've got a job here where we're trying to cover maternity leave, so why we give that job to a pregnant applicant, that's discriminatory, absolutely no question. But the claim could be brought against the manager themselves as well as the employing organization. And that's what I mean by joint and several liability, okay? Um, and that can have personal consequences, obviously, because a claim for compensation can be made against you um, as well as against uh, your employer um, you know, if you're operating in a managerial capacity. Um, types of discrimination, we've got direct, indirect victimization and harassment. Um, and I, I know that, um, I'll just go through this and then maybe pause for a moment. Yeah, sorry, I saw your hand up there, Steve. I'll come that. Direct discrimination, just very, very um, briefly, a person A discriminates against another person B if because of the protected characteristic, A treats B less favorably. Okay, that's the point I was trying to make earlier on. We've kind of, as I said before, got a little bit of ahead of ourselves. Um, to, Slides. There is a, what we call the statutory defence. If an employer can show that they've taken all reasonable steps to prevent the discrimination from occurring, then that means that the employer may actually get off the hook and it might be the, the individual employee, the individual manager who has done something that they shouldn't have done but even though they've been trained and they know what the culture of the workplace is, they've been told how they should behave, then there is a potential defence for an employer in that sense. Right. Um, I, no, sorry. Is that, is that sometimes not, is that very difficult for an employer to show that they've taken all reasonable steps, Paul? Well, if, if the employer can show that the, the employee has been trained and subjected to some kind of a quality training, um, then that is that goes quite a way to demonstrating that it's reasonable steps. It's not, it's not everything. It's not absolutely every kind of step you could take. It's reasonable steps. What's reasonable will be a question of fact and degree in relation to the particular circumstances. But if you haven't trained your staff, then you're going to fail in terms of trying to pass that test. I think that's, that's the kind of easier way to explain. If an employer has not trained its staff, inequality um, principles, then it will have no hope whatsoever of being able to rely on the statutory defence, okay? Right. But if, it's tr if it has a policy, if it's trained its staff, and then the manager still behaves in a wrong sort of way, uh, would the company then get, would, would the company then be at fault or the, or the manager well, might be at fault? In the example that you've just given there, sorry, I'm wiping the screen so it's a bit dusty. Um, in the example that you've just given there, if the, the policies and procedures in place, training has taken place, the employer is likely to have a good chance of showing that they have satisfied the test of the statutory defence, as we used to call it. Um, and that means that the chances of the employee themselves being held liable only or, or higher than, right. than they might otherwise be. Would it, would it help if the company themselves dismissed the manager or could we just leave them in place and uh, and allow them yeah, to be? Possibly, yes. I mean that that could be a, that could be a, an a, an issue about credibility, couldn't it? In terms of if the employee, oh, sorry, the employer and the manager who has done the discriminatory act, part company, because the employer is saying that behaviour is not tolerated here, then that actually helps to support the company's defence. I would say, yeah, yeah. Right. Can, can I ask as well, just while we're on this point, well. My assumption is we don't get an awful lot of direct discrimination, but we do get a lot of indirect discrimination. So people know, for example, 
that you can't ask women about their about their family and stuff like that. So they tend, tend to find other ways of doing it, or other ways of finding out, or other ways of asking. Is that is that your experience? Or are you still are we still getting cases of direct discrimination? Well, I think um, I mean this slide that we've got up on the screen at the minute is about indirect discrimination. I think it's important to establish the difference between direct and indirect because what you're describing there is still direct discrimination actually, but it's kind of direct discrimination by the back door or it's yeah. direct discrimination under the radar. It's not indirect discrimination in the sense of, of what the law means by that because indirect discrimination relates to a provision criteria or practice which is discriminatory. Um, and so, for example, if you were to say we only employ people on a full-time basis, that could be indirectly discriminatory against women because it's well known that women have more responsibility for childcare, care for dependents, and therefore that principle, which on the surface, on the face of it, has nothing whatsoever to do with gender, because it's you know full-time employment. It's not mentioning males or females, but actually indirectly, it is disproportionately sort of um, you know uh, has more of an impact, if you like, on on women than it would on men, um, and that and that is indirect discrimination. When you're saying that. Um, somebody may be discriminated against um but it's kind of hidden that you know somebody's kind of creating a hostile environment and not giving somebody a job somebody sees on the on the application that somebody suffers from depression for example and oh we don't want to give that person a job because they may be off work a lot and it, i know that's a stereotypical um, assumption which is not actually backed up by the facts for people with disabilities but that's the kind of attitude you might um be fighting against that would still be direct discrimination because it's the reason for not giving them the job is related to the medical condition which could be classed as a disability so even though the employer might say it's not we are dismissing we are not giving them a job because we need reliable staff if you like and again i'm using these kind of term terms and terminology which are not mine personally but trying to illustrate the point um then that would still be direct discrimination um the way that indirect discrimination can be defended is if you can show there's a proportionate means of achieving a legitimate aim. And that could be the case in certain situations uh, where an employer you know, needs somebody there over a particular period of time. You know, busy times in the morning, busy times in the afternoon, we need people to come in at a certain time. And somebody says, well, I, I can't come in because of childcare responsibilities. I need to be away at three in the afternoon. Then that that's kind of possibly uh, 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 practice, if you like, the hours of work, the busy times, that could be potentially legitimately justified. But again, it always depends upon, you know, the the um, the needs of the business, if you like, and, and that balancing up of, you know, rights and responsibilities. What's the legitimate business interest compared to the individual's protection under the law? Um, Saturday working, Sunday working, people with strong religious beliefs. I mean, there have been cases where people with Christian faith, the you know the sabbath is if you like is the sunday people of the jewish faith it's, it's a saturday so there have been cases where people have have been able to you know successfully bring claims and get awarded compensation for being required to work on a day which is against their you know particular religious belief and, and that's a you know uh just a fact of life if you like that a shop might be open seven days a week now whereas it wouldn't have been years ago but that business does need cover seven days a week but it doesn't automatically mean that you can demand that every single employee has to work every Saturday or every Sunday. You know, there are particular rules around protection, around um, you know, kind of shop work in that sense. Okay. Is there anything else that you wanted to act on? Sorry, ask on that particular point, or uh, I'm not sure where this fits in. You, you were talking about how a, how an organisation can show all the do not everything reasonable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I've, and I've just been reading about the the decision um, about the Morrison's case, uh, yeah. about vicarious liability. I know that wasn't strictly an equality case, but it, it does. I mean, it does seem very. It does seem that the Morrison's will have done everything reasonable, yet an employee runs after a car, opens the car door, drags the person out, and beats them about the head, as I understand it. Yeah. And Morrison's are held responsible for that. Yeah. How do the two uh, things interfere? 
I think that's that I think that case took a few people by surprise actually, because there is supposed to, I mean in, in the law, you kind of some of these old uh, phrases used, if an employee is on a frolic of their own, then you know, in, in terms of negligence law and all that kind of thing, then it's held it's been held that the employer is not responsible because the employee is doing something which is so far outside of you know the re- of what a reasonable person would think an employee might do. That, that means the employer shouldn't be held liable. And that and that's the kind of area that you're talking about here. Um, and I know it's not strictly an employment case or a, a kind of a, a quality law case, but it's a, it's an important one because it's been, you know, decided at a very high level. Um, and I think that even reading some of the commentary and the judgment on it, it seems, very, again, very fact-specific in that instance that... Um, chain of events occurred when somebody was doing their job and then they, they obviously went and, and attacked somebody. Um, many people will say it's, it doesn't seem fair that Morrison should be held responsible for the actions of an employee who has who was, was behaved in a very extreme aggressive way but that's what the judges have decided. Um, so therefore it does kind of extend um, the the law in that sense, so vicarious liability has has been moved on a stage, and that means employers need to be more aware of of that. Um, what they can do about it maybe is 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 a difficult question because if you've done all the training, maybe you wouldn't expect anybody to behave in that way. So maybe they would have to deal with specific instances of violent conduct and make it clear to employees if you do behave in that way, then you will be liable. And we you know, um, disclaim any kind of responsibility for your behaviour and conduct. Um, but that is, that is a, a bit of a strange one, that one. I, I, I accept that. Yeah. Well, oops, sorry, Paula, on this screen as well, could you... Um, I always struggle a little bit to understand what victimisation actually is, is, is differentiated between victimisation and discrimination. Could, could you give an example of victimisation? Yeah, well, um, I can. I mean, the, the, on the slide you can see it says that um, A victimises another person if A subjects that other person to a detriment because, and that's the key thing, because B has done a protected act or believes that they may do a protected act. That's the key thing with victimisation, the protected act. And so, for example, if somebody had brought a claim of discrimination or, or brought a claim of some description, um, to their employer in an employment tribunal, but they were still employed, um, and then they were, say, for example, not offered training opportunities. The, the bringing of the claim is a protected act. That's the point I need to make. Um, then that that anything related to that protected act, which is detrimental, not getting uh, promoted, not being given training opportunities, not getting a pay rise, that could be victimisation, as long as the protected act again, relates to protected characteristic, okay? So there's the kind of a, a couple of stages of the chain of causation, if you like. Um, not giving somebody a reference, for example, if somebody has brought a claim and they've left their employment and has, say, for example, won the claim or even lost the claim, and somebody doesn't give the reference because of that claim being brought, that um, claim, again, is a protected act, so therefore, not giving the reference is a detriment, potentially. And so that could be a, an example of victimization. Okay. Right. Yeah, thank you. Um, harassment's a good one. Um, it's quite a lot are in harassment. And I know that the session that we've got today is, is you know, time limited. But um, this, this is a useful way that people can protect themselves against um, you know, bullying, if you like. Under the health and safety law, you, you know, bullying is, is something which is... Um, potentially a claim that you could bring if a manager is treating you in a way which is intimidatory, aggressive. Um, remember, everything to do with the Equality Act needs to be related to a protected characteristic. Health and safety law, you don't. It's just if somebody creates a hostile environment for you, is, is a bully at work, that would be covered generally anyway. Um, the key thing for today's purposes, though, is, is the behaviour, um, does it have the purpose or effect of violating a person's dignity? Does it create an intimidating hostile, degrading, humiliating, or offensive environment. And if it does, then that is potentially harassment. The key thing there is, it's not the intention of the person who's doing the, um, you know, the, acting in a particular way, which is causing offence. And um, that's why we've got the two words, purpose or effect. Purpose covers things where it's deliberate, 
but effect covers situations where it's not deliberate and even maybe unconscious, um, not even aware that this is what the impact is. The key thing is the impact that the behavior has on you as the recipient. And that is very, very important and um, you know, a useful uh, way for people to, to challenge intimidatory conduct, like a working environment, the culture within the workplace. Um, you know, you were saying before, Steve, about the refereeing, the environment and the culture of the football pitch, if you like. Um, lots of people very fired up want to win the match, but if they're hurling abuse, which could be age-related, then that's a protected characteristic, and you could say that's harassment. It's creating a hostile, intimidating, offensive environment for you. I'm often reduced to tears, Paul. I'll need to come and talk to you about it. But. Well, it, I mean, I know you're kind of saying that in a humorous way, but it, it, it can have a very damaging impact on people. Yeah. Well, on, a, on a serious note, before, uh, can I ask, just, the way the law's phrased, does it need to be intimidating and hostile, or would no. one, so just no. one of those would be enough? No. If it's... Um, if it creates an intimidating environment or hostile or degrading, it's not ands. So it could be one of those things. It tends to be, I think those adjectives, if you like, um, are kind of fairly closely interlinked. And if something is intimidating, it wouldn't be too difficult to say it's also hostile. You know, it is degrading, I feel humiliated. So I think, you know, there, there are different words which kind of are you know, all lumped together. I think yeah. people not exactly mean the same thing, but um, I think you can, something can be offensive without making you feel humiliated, but right. it could be hostile. Um, so you it, know. Wouldn't, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't be a defense for me to say, well, that was only intimidating, it didn't fit hostile, or it certainly wasn't degrading or humiliating. No, the no def there, is a defense, though, yeah. there is a defense which is on the next slide, which is this one here. Right. Um, factors which should be taken into account, the last one, last bullet point there, whether it's reasonable for the conduct to have that effect. So if, if somebody is extremely hypersensitive, you know, um, some, say for example, a middle-aged man such as myself, somebody, it's my birthday and somebody gets a birthday card with, a, with an age-related joke on it, would it be reasonable for me to take umbrage at that and be really, really offended by that if that was just a one-off? Uh, and, you know, the, the purpose of the individual who gives me the card I'm sure I would not be the intention would not be to offend or humiliate or degrade or you know intimidate, but I could say I am offended, I am humiliated, I am degraded, I am you know intimidated if you like. But then a judge looking at that issue would have to look at whether it was reasonable for me to be so offended. Okay, so there is kind of a defence. Um, but you're sticking to the middle age category, are you? <laughs> as long as as long as I can get away with it, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Okay. Um, has anybody else got any questions on any of this yet? No? Okay. Um, we can have discrimination by association and discrimination by perception as well. So, oh, sorry, Katina, yes, did you want to ask a question? Yeah, I did. I, this is um, three slides back, okay. Um, and it was just a thought. It's not about employment as such, so you might say no. Um, but if we think about the new apprenticeship program that the government has introduced, three million apprentices um, by the end of this parliament, um, what I wanted to know is that that offer, that apprenticeship offer, does it, um, does it need to make sure that it does not discriminate by taking into account all the things that we know as evidence, so government research, for example, that has shown um, how previous programs may have discriminated against particular groups and how you can get, a, you know, how you can stop that happening and how you can make sure that, that there is a quality of access and opportunity in relation to a government funded program. Would that be covered? Um, not by something three slides ago. But it could be covered by something in a few slides' time. The public. Okay, sector. that's fine. <laughs> I'll yeah, hold on. Um, because no, no, that's I'll deal with it now. But um, the the issue there is about a, a government decision and a, a regulations or whatever that have been passed, um, which could be challengeable under the public sector equality duty. Um, 
and, and that's a three three step kind of duty if you like to eliminate discrimination to advance equality of opportunity and to foster good relations between people who have a particular protected characteristic and those who do not and if you're saying there is a body of research which shows that, that certain groups of people um, are disadvantaged um, in in the kind of age range or from the ethnic um, minority groups that you may be referring to or on a gender basis or LGBT basis um, then that evidence could be used to challenge the government to say you have not implemented these regulations in a way which is in keeping with section 149. So in theory there is something that can be done but that does not give an individual apprentice the right to challenge the regulations. It's not a right at private law, it's a right at public law if you like to challenge that administrative um, or you know kind of government decision um, by way of judicial review or, or in some way. Does that? That does, yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. All right. Okay, discrimination by association means that you do not have to have the protected characteristic yourself to bring a claim. There was a case um, several years ago about a mother who had a, a disabled child who was able to bring a claim under the disability discrimination rules because of her association with her child. She was not herself disabled, but her child was. Um, and, and that's how the principle became established. And now it's enshrined within um, the Equality Act. And also discrimination by perception. There have been a number of cases around, um, you know, um, harassment on the grounds of um, sexual orientation, where a person has not in fact been a gay man, but has been, you know, subject to abuse in a gender and um, sexual orientation related abuse. And that is held to have been against the law as well. Um, so that perception that you don't have to be that thing, somebody just has to, has to think you're that thing. And as long as the insult is related to the protected characteristic, then that triggers potential liability under the law. Okay. And very importantly, in terms of employment tribunal claims, you do not have to have any period of continuous employment. You have to have two years continuous service to bring a claim for normal unfair dismissal, unless it's for a health and safety reason or maybe whistleblowing. Um, but if you are dismissed because of a discriminatory reason, you don't have to have that two years service. You can be you can bring a claim under the Equality Act even if you haven't even been offered a job, if the reason for not being offered the job is discriminatory, so you don't have to have any continuous service at all. So that's an important um, practical um, you know, issue for potential claimants. Also, um, there's no limit on financial compensation in the Employment Tribunal. Um, whereas there is a limit on the unfair dismissal cases, there's a twenty-five thousand pounds jurisdiction in the um, uh, breach of contract jurisdiction, and also seventy-eight thousand three hundred and thirty-five, I think it is at the moment, in relation to unfair dismissal. Um, there's no financial limit at the top end for discrimination claims, but your loss of earnings will have to demonstrate that you should get a high award, because the the average awards for discrimination claims aren't that high, really. Um, I think Steve had some information on that that maybe the chip in. Yeah, it, it always fascinates me this. Uh, every year when they produce the annual figures or the median figures uh, as yeah. to who's top, who gets the most money. Uh, and this year it was sex discrimination. At, I think the median figure was 13,500. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Uh, and the lowest figure was religious discrimination, which was 1,800. Right. And, and the most of the discrimination protected characteristics are in the middle group of about eight to six thousand. Uh -huh. Apparently, the sex discrimination one was was um, was so high because of a number of high-profile cases with high awards of uh, six-figure awards. Yeah, um, yeah, and that can skew the figures. But I think I think a lot of people who hear the headlines or oh, such and such has been awarded millions of pounds or hundreds of thousands of pounds, those are extremely rare cases. Uh, the average person, you know, bringing a discrimination claim will be, you know, getting the awards that you just, um, you know, more likely to get the awards that you've, at the levels you've been talking about there. Yeah. Um, and there are statistics that you can download from the internet. The Employment Tribunal um, statistics are available, public documents. If you Google, Google that, you should be able to get the, this year's report. Um, one other thing with regard to discrimination claims, which is different to kind of um, unfair dismissal claims, is that you get you can get injury to feelings awards, and that's for how upset you are by how you've been treated. 
Um, normally, it doesn't matter how bad an employer is in terms of a dismissal case, you can be treated very, very badly, be really, really upset, and it doesn't matter in terms of being able to claim extra money because the compensation is, is limited to a calculation as to what your actual financial losses are, how much money you would have earned compared to how much you've actually lost, okay? Um, and what you may be earning from a new employer. Injury to feelings, lower band. Um, these figures have changed slightly recently, but roughly, just to give you a flavour as to, as to what they are. Lower band between 500 to 6,000 pounds, the middle band between six to 18,000 pounds, and upper band between 18 to 30,000 um, pounds based on the severity of behaviour. So it's only in the extreme um, awful cases where somebody's been subjected to uh, you know, very, very bad abuse on the grounds of a protected characteristic, you'd be looking at the top end. Of, a, of an injury to feelings um, award, okay? Um, we've already touched on disability to a, to a limited degree. There are various components here, physical or mental health impairment, which has substantial long-term adverse effect on normal day-to-day -day activities. We mentioned that in the context of the Kaltoft case and somebody who was morbidly obese. Um, again, the less favorable aspect of about the treatment and arising from disability um, is, is another um, claim which is potentially um, of use to people who do have a disability and um, we don't have to prove a comparator there. Impairment could adversely affect manual dexterity. There used to be a list in the Disability Discrimination Act Schedule 1 which is now removed so again it's all focused on what the actual factual situation is as to whether or not the test of disability will be passed. Um, perception of the risks of physical danger, for example, memory, ability to concentrate, hearing, eyesight, all of those things. Um, key thing about discrimination law around disabilities is there's an extra layer of complexity here about the duty to make reasonable adjustments. So if somebody is in work, then the employer has a duty to consider reasonable adjustments to try to keep them in work. And if somebody's applying for a job, um, then the, the potential employer has a duty to consider what reasonable adjustments could be made in order to give that disabled person a job. Things like adjustments to premises, um, duties, responsibilities, hours of work, different places of work, um, and, and, you know, and so on. Modifying procedures for testing or assessment in terms of giving people a, a level playing field at the interview stage, um, providing supervision and other kind of support. Um, all of those are, are relevant to um, you know, recruitment purposes. Well, just a, a couple of things. We get a lot of questions from employers or employers saying to us that if the person has a disability, we can't do anything, meaning that they, they, they don't want to dismiss um, because they're scared of the uh, uh, arising from a disability um, mm -hmm. angle. Um, I mean, I, I do try to tell them that's not the case, but it, it does seem to it does seem to kind of cause a lot of concern, probably because it's so new. Um, and it, but it doesn't; it's not intended, as far as I understand, to mean that you potentially cannot dismiss anybody with a disability. Not at all. No. Um, I mean, medic under the Employment Rights Act, which is a kind of you know the um, the law that we all operate under in terms of. You know, unfair dismissal law, redundancy protection, all of that kind of thing. There are a number of what are potentially fair reasons for dismissal. The typical ones would be redundancy, you know, the, the work has disappeared or is drying up. Um, conduct, misconduct, somebody is behaving in a bad way and therefore they lose their jobs. But also there is, um, you know, um, the kind of capacity, whether that might be the person doesn't have the skills or qualification to do the job, but also medical incapacity could be, you know, for capability reasons, you're not able to do the job anymore because of either a physical um, deterioration because of some medical condition or because of a mental health impairment. So medical incapacity is a potentially fair reason for dismissal. The key to all of this is communication, consultation. You've got to be honest with each other. You know, you've got to be transparent about the process that you're following. If you have a person who is either on long-term sick or a person who develops a disability throughout their working life, um, and I haven't got the statistics available for me at the, in front of me at the minute, but I think it's a very high percentage of actual disabled employees were not disabled when they started their working lives, but they develop a disability as they go through their working lives, potentially through 
because of getting older, maybe, at the risk of being age discriminatory there, or as a result of um, you know, developing a medical condition. So there are a, a large number of people who are actually disabled employees who you know, have developed that disability. And I think that, that transparency, that consultation, the communication, you know, what can you do? What can you still do? What can we help you to do? All of that, that's a conversation that should be happening. Um, and it's only at the end of all of that that an employer would be able to say, you know, we've tried all the reasonable adjustments. You know, we we maybe cannot continue to employ you in this role because it's not safe for you to be in this role anymore, or your ability to carry out the role is not at an acceptable level for us. Those those difficult conversations are not automatically unlawful or unfair or discriminatory, um, but you need to be, you know, deal with each situation in a respectful way. Um, and try to identify a way forwards. But if ultimately the employment relationship cannot continue, then that's potentially a fair reason for dismissal. Okay. Can, can I ask you a more, a more specific question, I suppose? There are a lot of companies, particularly manufacturing, that use the Bradford Factor system. Yes, yeah. Um, uh, if, uh, if anybody doesn't know what the Bradford Factor is, basically it's a, it's a way of awarding points per absence. Um, and typically, Non-HR people tend to love it, particularly engineering and managers, because it's it's their thing. It's black and white. So if you're off for two days, that equals a certain number of points. Um, there is a, a company that we're having a debate with, and, or you could call it an argument, I suppose, that that refuse to accept that anybody has a disability. So all of their absences, they do take into account any absence related to pregnancy but they won't take into account any absence related to a disability so you get Bradford factor points and ultimately could get dismissed at the end of it all um, my view it my view would be that you should consider not awarding people points if it's a disability related mm -hmm. absence of some description not absolutely black and white but yeah. um, what what's your view on Bradford factor system? Um, I think the Bradford factor scoring system can be useful actually in, in some respects, but that scenario I think you're describing to me there, where there's this kind of rigid, kind of fixed approach to it, we will not consider that that is not that is not a sensible approach for any employer to take because you should be looking at the characteristics of the individual. And that might mean that this particular person has a disability. And if you're seeing our system does not acknowledge that, then that's unlawful. I think there's no question about that. You see, what you're describing there is a provision criteria and a practice maybe as well. So you could have direct discrimination, but it could also be indirect discrimination. So you could have two um, arguments there that the imposition of that Bradford factor scoring system is disproportionately um, you know, disadvantageous, if you like, to the person who has a disability who may be um, not at work as much as a person who doesn't have a disability. But again, you can make assumptions there about the person who may have a disability. The company do have two arguments that, uh, that have some merit in, in a little way. One is that it's, 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 it's easier for managers to manage if there are less rules and they don't have to work out what, what's a disability. And secondly, that they claim that well, every one of our employees will, will therefore have a, will come up with a disability given the wide uh, definition of, of a disability. Yeah, well I think, I think that's a disappointing attitude, um, if I can express personal opinion there, because it's, it's starting from the point of view of mistrusting everybody, rather yeah. than start from the point of view of trusting everybody. And, and I would like to think that most people can be trusted, although I, maybe I'm bit, being a bit naive there. And, and it's only, and, and that would enable the genuine cases to be dealt with fairly and properly. You know, um, the, the Bradford Factor scoring system, I should also emphasize here, is related to attendance, not necessarily, the, uh, that's how it should be used. It's the attendance score, um, and it shouldn't really necessarily um, be related to the reason for the absence. So the medical side of things using the Bradford Factor score should actually be separated out. It's the attendance level, and if you have a level of attendance within the organization which is acceptable, and you're above or below the lane, that's how you should use the Bradford Factor score to say this level of attendance, you're way above the lane, that's unacceptable. And you, you know, have a, a program to try to improve the attendance. 
and that might be looking at the reasons for their absence, i.e. the medical conditions, etc. Um, but I think that rigid application of the Bradford Factor scoring system in the way that you describe is, is very risky for the employer. And I think that somebody who is, is at the wrong end of that, the you know, discriminatory end of that, could have a valid claim if they are a disabled person. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll, I'll continue trying to convince them. Yeah. Okay, well, good luck with that. Okay. Um, yeah, reasonableness covers things like size, administrative resources of the employer, the level of disruption and cost as well. Um, very briefly, company directors, fiduciary duties, outsourcing procurement contracts, delivery of services to the public, that is something that should be taken into account at the highest level, which is always worth remembering. Um, and this, um, Katina, coming on to your point, I think the question that you asked, this is kind of public authorities must, in the exercise of their functions, have due regard to the need to, and there you've got your three um, examples of what the public sector, the public duty is, section 149. Um, and these are examples of what that means in practice, remove disadvantages, take steps to meet the needs of persons who share a characteristic, etc., um, and encourage people to participate in public life. Um, I am, sorry, I just clicked on that um, point because I didn't mean to. And also tackling prejudice and promoting understanding. So therefore there is a, an actual positive duty on public sector bodies. And this includes private sector bodies that are given public sector functions, if you like. So the outsourcing of public sector contracts to private sector organisations, these duties follow and should flow from that. Yes, Katina? That probably in the learning and skills sector or education training, however you want to describe it, is probably one of the least well understood things that where um, independent training providers or employers are delivering a contract for the skills funding agency, uh, then actually they're bound by the public sector quality duty in the same way. And we have endless difficulties over making that clear to people so it's really great that you've made that very clear there i should be using that snippet all the time good good, good. i'm pleased to hear it it's um I, i'm very very happy for people to you know to, to use it in the best way possible I, I should have said at the outset though that you know these um it's not specific legal advice that's being given here it's really it's kind of just general overview um if you do need specific advice you should you know contact a, a, a lawyer who can you know give you proper opinion based on just very quickly I, I recently had a discussion with a school who were telling me that you know, this no longer existed because david cameron scrapped it um well that's so, wrong so we, don't, so we don't need to do it anymore um and i i did point out that he, he did mention it in a speech but the law hasn't changed at all on this no, it hasn't it hasn't yeah, so that's inter it's interesting to, 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 you know, get an example of the kind of, um, you know, level of misinformation that's out there. Um, it's disappointing. Other examples of how this can be used, I mean, I have actually had cases like this before, disputes between neighbours and tenants, um, acting for a, an organisation which has a, a residential unit um, for children, uh, um, Medical condition. Andrea, can you stop typing? We can hear it because you're unmuted. Right. So just chip in with what it was you wanted to say rather than typing. It sounds terrible when somebody's clacking away. <laughs> Sorry. I think you're unmuted, Andrea. You need to unmute and speak. Yeah. On, on under the current economic climate, um, obviously there's a lot of public sector cuts. Uh, has have they got the right not not to enforce the law, um, or can they, can they opt out uh, because of the funding cuts? Who who I didn't hear the start of that. I, I heard the bit about um, you know the cuts, but are, are you talking about yeah. specific local, authority, local authorities in in particular? Well, not really, no. But it, it, what what tends to happen is they, even though people know that there may be a legal case to bring, it's extremely expensive to bring it. So therefore, I think a lot of inertia and not knowing how to do it and not having the funding to do it, not having the maybe the professional support to do it, that allows local authorities and other government agencies to get away with it, I think, putting it bluntly. Um, doesn't mean to say that, and, and the costs can be really, really prohibitive, you know, for what benefit? I think that's the thing. I know that there'll be lots of people maybe who, who you know, are under 
extreme pressure in terms of financial support being withdrawn and that will have an impact. And yes, those things could be challenged, um, but the, the defense, if you like, is going to maybe could be that you know, the, the local authority doesn't have the money. doesn't mean to say that the law is not breached, but there, may be, there will always again be that kind of balancing um, you know, act that needs to go on as well. Um, but health and social care services, obviously, you know, if that's on the list of things, education services as well. I have acted for, for you know, um, parents of a disabled child who challenged the withdrawal of a special educational needs kind of provision. So, so the, the law is being used by certain people in, in situations like that. And I think it probably could be used an awful lot more if more people knew how to do it and that they could do it. They knew a bit more about what the law actually uh, is, it says. Um, remedies, um, obviously we talked about employment tribunal jurisdiction, county court for services. Those cases we talked about before, um, the, the bed and breakfast case and the, make, the, the cake decoration case, they're not employment tribunal cases, they're county court cases. Okay? Um, judicial review, we talked about Katina with challenging um, government kind of decisions and, and local authority decisions. And obviously the um, and Human Rights Commission do have an enforcement arm. They can support cases as well. Um, and that's it. And I think, I can't believe it, I think we're absolutely bang on time for your time estimate, Katina, which is um, 1.45, which is longer. So you must have known something. We must have needed the time. So um, that's pretty good. I mean, I'm very happy to, to take other questions as well, if, the, if there are any. But um, I, hope, I hope that that's been useful and informative to, to everybody who's been here today and for anybody who, who you know, uh, looks at this um, webinar on on the net at whatever point in the future thank you paul that was really good enjoyed it yeah. thanks paul well, thanks for your contribution i found it really appreciate useful it. To you. i'm thank going to you. stop recording